Hello and welcome to a new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. This episode is kindly supported by Carpenters Group. Carpenters Group are one of the UK's leading providers of insurance and legal services, delivering a variety of claim solutions to insurers, brokers, policyholders. And they have over a thousand employees across five locations of their firm. You can find out more about their work at carpentersgroup.co.uk. I'm Sally Penny, MBE, a barrister at Kenworthy's Chambers in Manchester, the Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers, the founder of Women in the Law UK, and I'm also a bencher at Gray's Inn. You can find out more about the work I do with Women in the Law UK at womeninlawuk.com. Please do also support the limited edition series of books, Talking Law, which are available on Amazon with proceeds going to charity. You can now also listen to my brand new podcast, The Law and Guidance Podcast, which is all about law, trial preparation, advocacy. Back to today. Today I'm talking law with the joint owner and director of Carpenters Group, Donna Scully. Donna is an exceptionally experienced lawyer and has won several awards, has been active in shaping both legislation and best practice across the personal injury and insurance sectors for nearly 25 years. She's also an established public speaker and writes regularly on fraud and industry reform. I began our interview by asking Donna to tell me more about the areas of law the Carpenters specialises in. So Carpenters Group is a sort of a niche motor uh, personal injury practice in terms of the legal arm of it. But we also do insurance services. So we've kind of progressed from being a, a law firm originally over 20 years ago to kind of diversifying into insurance services. We've got a big um, first notification of law center, a call center, and um, we we do so, lots of different claims handling. So it, it's kind of an unusual setup, but there is a legal arm. So we're still legal. Um, and so we mostly have personal injury lawyers. Right. Now, Donna, you know, I love the law. I'm interested in the law, but actually I'm interested in the people in the law, which is why I've invited you to this podcast. So I wonder if we can start with your journey. How did you become a lawyer? Because the path has been an interesting one, hasn't it? I suppose I didn't set out to be a lawyer. Law found me, but the way it found me was that I did leave school at 16. Um, I went to a very religious convent school in Dublin where I was sort of groomed to be a wife. Mm. Um, and I and I did leave too early, but I did a secretarial course because my granny made me so that I'd be able to eat and, and pay rent and stuff afterwards. So <laughs> I ended up as a le- um, in law as a, as a secretary. Right. So office junior, then secretary. And I worked in Fitzwilliam Square in Dublin as a legal secretary for a young lawyer. And I really enjoyed that. I mean, he was kind of a probate lawyer, I think, at the time. But I just, you know, I love the client contact. And then I, when I was 20, I moved to England. Wow. Um, I had a holiday. I had a holiday romance, Sally. Hello. I'm going to be really honest about this. I'm sorry. It's not a, <laughs> it's a terrible story, but I did. <laughs> I, met, I met it, Geordie, on holiday and I emigrated to Newcastle upon Tyne. I didn't even know where it was, um, but I went there and it was very cold. But I got a sec, I got, became a secretary there as well, a legal secretary in a small legal aid practice above a jeweler's wow. at, the, the, at the bottom of the big market yes. in Newcastle. So, I continued. And then I, I, I worked for a really great uh, partner there and he was great and I did everything for him and I was answering the phone, dealing with his clients. And I just thought, I'm 21 years old. I'm a secretary. Is this it? Yeah. You know, I was already a bit bored and thinking there has to be more, you know, and I really enjoyed the law, but I wanted to, to be seeing my own clients, if you like, and doing my own stuff. So I applied to Newcastle to do a law degree, but I couldn't get funding. Um, because of my status. So I I found out about ILEX and wow. the Institute of Legal Executives. So it was another route for me, which I could afford and which I, I could still work, which was great. Yeah. So two years in Newcastle of that, and then I could transfer to London. I moved to London then, and I did two years in London doing ILEX. So I did yeah. the four years. So I became a qualified uh, legal executive, wow. but I but I wanted to be a solicitor. I, I kind of wanted to go all the way because I'd, I'd originally wanted to do a law degree. So I did the CPE 
Um, and then eventually, after about four million years, I did yeah. the LPC. But I did LPC full time. I went, I did actually get to university. It was City of London Poly, but it just became London Guildhall University the year I went. Yeah. So I was so excited that I was going to university for 10 months because I'd never been. So I did the LPC and then I qualified around 30, I think it was. So it kind of took me about nine years. Wow. Yeah, it was a big, long, 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 long story. But yeah, but great in the end because I got there. Yes. But Donna, that's amazing because actually you would have been a little bit older than, you know, most people. If yeah. I think, gosh, I think I was qualified at what, 21, 22. Um and getting there, because that is an avenue, and I know you are passionate about social mobility, as am I, that you're passionate about, actually, that people should be able to enter the law uh, and remain in the law through whatever that route is. So your story is really a real one and an extraordinary one, really, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I suppose it's why I tell it so much. I think in the last few years, you know, when I was younger, I kind of suffered from imposter syndrome, and I, did, I was a bit... I wasn't ashamed, but I was kind of like, if people find out I haven't got a, a law degree, I didn't go to university, especially in London. I worked at Mishkondorea for a while. Wow. And then I worked at Jeffrey Green Russell. So, you know, y- you are so different to everybody else, especially then. I think there's a, a, probably a little bit more of a mix now, but I really was so different that I was a bit like, you know, trying to fit in. Whereas mm-hmm. now I'm older and a bit bolder. I'm like, I, I'm not going to fit in. I'm going to tell you my story because it's different and yeah. it might inspire somebody like me who yeah. thinks the law is not open to you. And I say, well, it is. I mean, I'm not going to lie to them and say it's easy, but it, but if you want it, there isn't. There isn't. And it's something I really like about the UK because I don't know if I could have done this in Ireland because it was more elitist over there. Yeah. In terms of me leaving school. But when I came here and I wanted to enter the law, the minimum requirement was four O levels mm. for me to do ILEX, which is a really great, you know, that's a low bar from, you know, I, yeah. I, I could I could do that even leaving school at 16. So I think it gave me that opportunity. And I think it's important. That's why we shouldn't kind of write people off because they make mistakes early. We should give yeah. them another chance. And I got another chance and I'd like to see other people get chances like that too. Which is fantastic, especially coming from the top, um, as it were, because I, I think you do need people in senior roles at board level to be talking about the issues. The recruitment is great. You know, there's been a great drive, although I'll come to that in a moment. But we do need people like yourself, you know, being authentic, talking about the imposter syndrome, talking about the importance of social mobility and second chances, don't we? Donna, I, I want to talk for a moment about your work outside of the workplace, if you like. You are hugely involved in charity work. You have been involved in speaking on quite a lot of consultations and being quite collaborative. There's been quite a lot of government work that you've been involved in. Can you talk to me a little bit about that, why you do that and how you've got involved in that, particularly in your sector? I mean, the big change for me, I mean, listen, I'm a very opinionated person. I'm a bit of a... (laughs) I know. I see your Twitter feed. I know. Sorry. (laughs) But I... And I, and I, you know, I'm very strong in my beliefs and I, I, I'm a campaigner by nature. So it's just how you're made, isn't it? So I'm, I, and especially as you get older and you might get a little bit more success, you get more of a voice, don't you? So you get a chance to, to say things and people might listen and you get a, a platform to say it. So for me though, the big turning point was about 10 years ago, I was asked to become the chairman of the Motor Accident Solicitor Society, MASS. Mm. And at the time, I was really reluctant to do it because I was, my, the business was quite young. My boys were quite young. I just felt like I, and I didn't have enough capacity. But, you know, John, who's my partner and my husband, pushed me into doing it. And it was probably one of the best things I've ever done in terms of progressing to learning more and doing more. But that was the turning point, really, Sally, because... You get, you know, for two years, I was chair of the society. I had to learn politics. I had to learn about public speaking. I had to learn about, you know, going to the Ministry of Justice and, you know, dealing with both sides. Like, you know, on my, my, the opposite side to me is the big insurance industry. So it was really good for me. And, and when you become chair, you kind of have your, you know, your 100 day plan or your mission statement or whatever. And two things for me that I decided in the two years that I was going to be really in, um, looking at was, collaboration because I felt there was a big divide between very and a very adversarial feel in in my yes. you know motor insurance market um a lot of fi- fighting which cost a lot of money and was not good for customer journey or customer 
uh, care. So I was that was one of my big issues. And also fighting fraud more collaboratively, that we shouldn't be against each other on fraud. That's that's something we're very joined up about. We, there shouldn't be fraud and we should be very uh, close on that. So that's kind of where it comes from. And I did two years and it's, it's really funny because I did two years and then obviously the boys were still young and I was very busy at Carpenters and we had a public affairs guy, Tim, and he said to me at the end of the two years, now you can either go off and slink into the, the, you know, the background again, or you can use your platform that you've had in these two years and, and the, the, the people knowing you to going on and doing more. And that's kind of when I joined Twitter. Um, he told me he said I should join Twitter and that's when I kind of started to do more and speak more and maybe be a bit more honest about everything about me and you know that was so that's the turning point listen I think it's in me as an Irish person to tell stories and to be outgoing I'm not I'm not a massively shy person obviously but (laughs) I just think it was yeah it suited me and you know and, and, and I think when I first went to round tables, there would be like, you know, um, it was like a, a, an echo chamber. Yeah. So you'd have like nine defendant people and one claimant person. And I was like, why haven't we got more of a balance here? Yeah. I, I, and I do think now when I go to meetings, there is more of a balance. There's more, there's more representation from different areas of the industry. So you get a better debate and you get a better outcome. Yeah. So I, th- I mean, I'm not, I haven't achieved that on my, on my own, but I think I've probably been one of the people to, to push it and to promote it. And then other people have bought into it and we've kind of made it happen. So that's, that's, that's the background. It really is about mass, I think, get it setting me on that road. Yes, absolutely. And the work you've been doing is, has been extraordinary from my, my research. But let's just talk for a moment from, from your answer to that question. Two things. One, I want to ask you about social media. I know I said I follow you on Twitter. But let me tell you that uh, one of my favourite photographs on Twitter is the one which came <laughs> out of lockdown, uh, which is you dressed in a, a lovely, I think it's a top and a skirt, heels on, flat, flat out on the, on the front. And I thought, gosh, that captures lockdown where we're all exhausted. You've not passed out or anything. But my question is just, um, when did you learn to embrace social media, but especially Twitter and um, really any advice for people using it? I took to it straight away in the sense that I liked it because I thought it was fun. And I thought it was really interactive and I thought it was really informative. I mean, I follow some amazing people, some who've been on your podcasts, um, who I learn from every day. Yeah. I love their take on things that are happening in the world, but I also love their humor and some of the one liners, you know, um, you know, I just love it. I don't, I, I don't want to name anybody because there's too many to name and I don't want to leave anybody <laughs> out. But um, I, Actually, Sean Jones, it's his birthday today, you know, I've just oh. wished him a happy birthday, but he's one of my favorites, you know, and obviously he does the billable hour and everything. But, you know, there's people you go on there and you look out for them and you look to know what they're up to. And so I, I took to it because I think I'm a storyteller, as I said. I think um, I have a, I'm, I'm a very reverent, you know, as a Dubliner, I'm very irreverent. I don't take life too seriously in the main. And I have quite a good sense of humor because we're, you have to have, because, you know, in, in, in Dublin, you, you know, people are like taking the mick out of you all the time. So, and I think that kind of, and I suppose another thing for me on Twitter is that I didn't go on to fight. I'm not there to fight. And I hope people notice that I have an opinion. I'll say my opinion and I don't want to offend people either. Um, so if someone starts to come back at me, it's been very, very occasionally over the last 10 years that I've come back and had a little row. And I've probably had a glass of wine when I did that, which I've regretted. So I, I tend to, you know, and I, and I and it's a great place for good as well, Sally. You know, if you want to promote something or get people involved or engage with them. And when we're doing a big social mobility campaign with the 93 found, 93% Foundation at the moment, State School Proud. Now that, you know, Twitter and LinkedIn are brilliant for that. And we're putting our stories out and, you know, hopefully other people who went to state schools and maybe younger people will see that these successful people that as they see them are just really normal and whatever. So I think there's a great side of social media. And in COVID, especially, I have found a great company. I don't know about you. It's just been great company. And I've probably gone way over the top and I'm probably way overexposed now and everyone's sick of me and I'll have to go missing after COVID. But I just felt I just have had great fun. And that picture 
you know, poor John, my husband, and John Carpenter, who's obviously the, the, the main man at Carpenters. But we, we did this out in, didn't we? You know, every yeah. weekend we got dressed up and we in this conservatory and we had a few drinks and a takeaway. And I think I just was a bit tipsy and I was just saying to him, I'm just so tired and fed up. And like we were laughing about it. And I just lay on the floor and he took the photograph. So it's one of those moments, isn't it, that you capture? <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's brilliant. And, and, and a, a, a guy I know got it framed for me, you know, on a canvas and sent it to me, um, who I love on Twitter as well. So, I, it, you know what? It's been very tough the last 18 months, like yeah. really. And I think anywhere to have a laugh and the out in, you know, the hashtag out in, other people have joined in and said it, they've got dressed up. And it's just that, you know what? If we can't be nice to each other and, and be friendly at the moment, I don't know when we can. Yeah. Yeah, so. I wholly, wholly agree. Now, Donna, the second question I wanted to ask you from uh, my f- initial question was um, you were talking about diverse people around the boardroom, diverse specialisms, not just having one claimant uh, and nine defendants uh, around the table, where, but we needed a balance. And so I wanted to ask you about diversity in the workplace as a senior woman. And what are you doing at Carpenters, not just on gender, but in general? Because race is always a problem, particularly in Liverpool. You're not alone. And it's not a criticism as such yet. Uh, and no. I know you're working to address that. But your gender balance is actually rather good because I've been looking at some of the stats. Yes. Can you share with me what you've been doing? You know, it was a real surprise to us. I think the SRA did an audit a few years ago on gender balance. Yeah. And we completed the survey and found out we were like 50 50 and yeah. and, and even and i was absolutely delighted and you know it was like we were all it was like a, you know that kind of moment a light bulb moment we went wow you know so the the really the truth is that it's just about i think it's the culture so i think from the day from day one there's two of us there's john and i i'm massively into equality obviously and, and diversity um, and then John is as well. And and I think w- we didn't knowingly go in thinking, you know, we have to have loads of women. We went in thinking it's got to be a meritocracy. Yes. So best person for the job. But we brought flexible working in really early, even though we were small. I think that ticks another box and helps. We did, because I'm ILEX and because I've, the way I've become a lawyer, yeah. we did a lot of in-house training and we, we back training and we paid for, for people. And lo and behold, lo and behold, a lot of women came forward to take that free training and to, and to progress, because there's a lot of ambition in that pool that gets you know doesn't get kind of um, you know a chance to do anything. So really, that was it. So I think that's why if I ever get asked to talk about it, it and why we're there, and I say you know there was there's been no tokens, there's been no um, positive discrimination, but you really have to live it and put things in place that help it and help it to progress and, and, and help people to come forward. I mean, you know, even the other great thing, I suppose, when, when that survey came out from the SRA is that we're 50-50 top to bottom. Yes, I know. I, I've seen it because it's, it's, yeah. um, it, it's an audit. That's where I was getting the, the, the figure and the yeah. question from, um, which is great because I suppose you probably weren't using a quota system, but h- having the experience and the vari- your own personal experience clearly – must have attracted that and I, and I think the flexible working thing was was I wanted that because you know I had twins when I was like 37 and you're trying to juggle them at work and you understand that the you know the issues about trying to get them to school and pick them up and you know sickness and all that so I think yeah I think you're right I probably probably it was down to my experience a bit but I think you know John was very you know very wanted that as well and thought it was a great idea um, and I think, yeah, all those things. And I, and I am delighted and I am really proud because I'm old enough to have remembered when it was really bad. You know, when the, I'd go to meetings and there'd be eight men yes. and two women. Yeah. Um, and, and for me as well, in London, it wasn't so bad, you know, and it was a lot, you know, 20, I'm 24 years, I think I'm in Merseyside. So 24 years ago in London, it was, it was getting better, you know, and it was, there were more women around the table. Then I moved north. Yeah. Oh my goodness, you know. You know, yeah. I mean, spot the woman, yeah. you know, it's just men everywhere, especially in law, you know, it was like, oh my <laughs> God, but that has, it, it is changing and, and, it, yeah. and it is a lot more, better than it, than it was and there's a better balance, but there's, there's a, lot, a long way to go. Uh, yes, there is. And would you say that, and I say this a lot, that actually um, we, we need men and women, like left and right, 
we need both to drive and we certainly need both to drive change. So do you think it was helpful, therefore, to have John as well buying into yeah. that? Because I do believe we need our male colleagues to get the points that we're making uh, on, you know, from gender pay gap to progression, so on and so forth. Would you agree that we do need our male? Co- we can't exclude them. It's completely pointless to be on board, with, to buy into what we're saying. Oh, absolutely, completely. Um, I mean, even from my point of view, when I moved to Merseyside, I was I wanted to get a job in a PI practice in Liverpool yes. because I I'd never run a business. I didn't know how to run a business, and John had had set up a small commercial practice on his own. It was three years old, and he said, "No, you come and join me and set up a personal injury part of the business." And I thought, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. How would I, you know? And he was like, "Of course you can do it." And I just think that belief in you as a woman. You know, that kind of not looking at your sex, just thinking, well, I think you're a great lawyer. I want you to try it. Just have a go. And, you know, I think that was that respect that people show you because, you know, you are insecure and you do suffer from imposter syndrome. And you think, jeepers, I'm not even meant to be a lawyer. How am I supposed to run a business? And I've never done it. But I think I think and I've met some brilliant men over the years who've been so supportive and genuinely want to see that balance and genuinely enjoy sitting around a table where you've got men and women, because we bring different things to the table. And I think you get a better outcome. You run a business better. Um, I just, you know, all in all, the really good men. I know what carpenters, I mean, the, the guys we have there, and they have to put up with a lot of women, we're everywhere. <laughs> but they really, I think they enjoy it, you know, and, and there is a good atmosphere because I think women are, you know, we do see the funny side of things. I think we work really hard, but we have, you know, I'm not saying men haven't got a good sense of humor, but I think, you know, we kind of bring that in, don't we? So, yeah, I do I do think the men are really important. And I think for me, a big game changer in this as well is that younger men and, and maybe older men want to help with the childcare, want to be part of what's yes. happening with the children. Yes. And I think we need, we need em- employers and society to accept that and there to be no stigma about saying, I've got to go and collect my child who's sick and I'm a man. Yes. You know, years ago, that couldn't happen. I mean, a woman couldn't say she was collecting a sick child either, really, or it would be bad for her. But a man certainly w- couldn't. So I think that for me, I hear young men now saying that they combine their diaries with their wives or their girlfriends. And they, they you know, I'm, I'm just blown away by that. I love it. And I think that is a game changer. You know, if we can share the childcare and share things, then we'll all get an opportunity to progress and do what we want to do. Absolutely. Although there is an argument about, for example, paternity leave uh, and the yeah. payment and the structure. But, you know, I always say I'm not in politics. I'm a lawyer. Um, but, you know, when I spend a lot of time advising men who just want to be able to get into an agreement so that they can pick their children up or where, you know, the men, the claimants will be saying they've been told, oh, do you want to give away your career? That concerns me because it means we're delaying the equality. But Donna, I want to move on to a question that I love asking. What's your favourite book and why? And then I want to ask you about a favourite fictional lawyer, character that you might want to share with us. I, I, do, I know you asked this question, so I've been thinking about it. And there's loads of books, isn't there, that, I you know, can, I know. I, I, that I can think about. But there is a book that from years ago, and my my, my dad's dead, but his, his sister sent me this book, um, Mari, and she said to me, this book makes me think of you. Um, she'd read it and it was really big at the time. It was It's by an Irish, it's um, an autobiography by an Irish uh, businessman, successful businessman called Bill Cullen. And the book is called It's a Long Way from Penny Apples. When I read it, I could see what she was saying. I mean, he was obviously way more successful than me at the time. So, But it was about a guy from inner city Dublin like me. He'd gone to like a Christian brother school. I went to a, obviously convent school. He um, got a scholarship to a better school. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't get that opportunity. But he um, had had all these jobs like selling penny apples. And he it's a rags to riches story, but it's not sad. I mean, it's, his life was worse than mine. And it was, it was sad in lots of ways. Very poor. But it's such a he does it in such a humorous way and it's really uplifting and it and it's really a wonderful book to read. So that's the book that really stands out for me. And the reason as well is that what well, kind of continued the theme of the book because my brother and I, there's only my brother and I, and 
whenever over the years I do something that's amazing that I didn't think I'd ever do. Mm. And I really do like to try things. When I lived in London, I did everything I could while I was there. So for example, you know, the last night of the proms, I went to the, I went to the opera, I went everywhere. And I, and even like, if I sit around at the ministry of justice for the first time, things like that, that really blow my mind from where I come from. Yeah. I, I text my brother and I tell him what I've done. And then I always say, it's a long way from dot, 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 Ormond Square, which is inner city place that I'm from. So it's not Penny Apples, but it's like this kind of council yeah. estate. Yeah. And he, so if he ever listens to this, he'll laugh. But that's, so that's the book because of it's a long way from. Um, so it, it resonates. Well, just, just, just that. Um, I, I don't think that my podcast is uh uh, as prestigious, uh, if you like, uh, but uh, we have had some fantastic guests on here. No, th- no, this is definitely a moment. This is definitely one of those moments. Oh uh, no, I'll I'll start feeling emotional now because this was a, <laughs> a little podcast which I started because I wanted to showcase the leaders in law who had a story to tell, which was different to the impression sometimes that the public or young people can form about our profession, and so it's great to tell those stories and to have guests like you who tell us their true journeys uh, as to where they've got to. So it is really great to have you and it's great for you to think, you know, it's a it's a, it's a great honour. I know we're getting all yes. emotional now. Um, yeah, I know. But Donna, if you had a fictional lawyer, who would it be? And actually, and another question I've got is who would play you in a book or a film? I'm going to be really naff here. And I don't know if anyone else has ever said this. I, I listened to all your podcasts, so I don't remember hearing this, but it, it also involves my brother again, because it's um, when I li- when I was in Newcastle, I worked in this little legal aid practice above a jeweler. So it was really, you know, it wasn't glamorous at all. And we were all on top of each other. And at the time, LA Law came out. Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. Um, which was really glamorous, wasn't it? And, and, and gorgeous. And I couldn't, you know, I was like, that's nothing like my job or my life. So I thought <laughs> it was just ridiculous. But then um and and grace van owen you know who was on there yeah um, she was when you I, I, listen i'm showing my age now but she, i think she was from the partridge family she was just gorgeous and she was a da i think but i think she had a drink problem so people might say that was why she was like me as well but anyway um because <laughs> i do like a glass of wine but um she so I, then i went down to london and the next place i worked in was mish Condorea. so you can imagine the jump from the, the yes. legal aid practice to mish Condorea. Yes. so when I went down there and I was a trainee legal exec and I was doing trade union personal injury work and we moved to new offices kind of, I don't know, I think a year in there. And I got this, I shared a big glass office with this woman with my name on the door, you know, and you're like, so I said to my brother, I am Grace Van Owen now in LA Law. Like I've made it. <laughs> so that's the character. Whenever I think of that moment, like, you know, when they, when they put the name on the glass door and I just thought, oh my God, you know, from, from Dublin to here, it was definitely, it's a long way from that moment. But yeah. so Grace Van Owen from LA Law. Hopefully someone on here is old enough to know who I'm talking about. Oh yeah, I need to Google. I, I was thinking of another character actually, the um, one of the black lawyers, because it was a program, of course, which featured black black American actors, and we didn't see them um, in a legal capacity here very often. So um, I, I do remember la- latterly, his name will come to me. Mr. Sufenti, I can't remember his name in the program, but I don't know what it is, but he's a gorgeous guy, yes, wasn't he? Yes. All, everybody was gorgeous in it. I, mean, everybody I know, was like, you know, beautiful people. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Donna, um, what if someone was going to play your life story? But who do you think, you know, if there was a going to be a program about your life? Because it's quite a story. Oh God, I don't know. I mean, would they have to be Irish, or could they just maybe they could just do the Irish accent, couldn't they? And they oh. wouldn't have to be Irish, but. Yes, yeah. I do, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think, and I'm trying to think of uh, Sinead Cusack, or I don't know. I mean, oh, she's yes, older I than like me. Her. It doesn't age. Age doesn't matter. No, I mean, listen, I, ideally, I want somebody young and great to play I me. Mean, no, nobody older as me or, or older <laughs> than me. But I can't think of any any good. Um, I mean, there's loads of great Irish actresses, isn't there? But I think I'd have to be. I'd have to choose an Irish one, wouldn't I? Yeah, yes, I know. And then there, and there are. There are. There are plenty. Um, so, 
Um, Donna, um, it's quite interesting um, hearing sort of your influences and indeed your journey into law. And But I wonder if I can ask you about well-being. You know, our job is long hours. What do you do for well-being or what would you like to do? Because the reality is the burnout rate is high. It's a profession that people leave the most, I can't remember the statistics, to do something else, the legal profession. And actually, well-being isn't great. So I wonder no. what do you do for your well-being or what would you like to do? Because you look great. And I don't know if you're like me, you know, chasing exercise that involves sweat or whether you're doing other kind of mindfulness things. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest with you and say I was really bad at it for years. So well-being was way down on my list because work was up there. The boys were up there, you know, my family in Ireland, everything came first. And I was, I lived a very stressful life and I was always on the run and I seemed to be able to cope with it. You know, I would just push myself and push myself. And then I think about seven or eight years ago, I, um, John was unwell and I was looking after him. And then that was kind of, you know, when you just think, oh my God, this, I'm running on empty. I, and, and I think you start, sometimes you need something like that to happen to make you really stop and think. And that was my moment where I went because my neck was sore and my back was sore all the time, um, you know, and I was just kind of, I was fed up. And I suppose I was coming towards, you know, I knew the menopause was going to come down the road as well. And everything was just, I just thought to myself, if I don't start looking after myself now, it's going to be tricky. So I did. So I kind of stopped. And it, I also, you know, I stepped down as running carpenters. I ran carpenters for 20 years or something. So we, ha we then got a board and a CEO. So I had a bit more time because I wanted to spend more time with the boys as well. So I took up Pilates because my physio told me I should. And he said, you can't keep coming to me for, you know, emergency treatment because I would get, I'd leave my back for three or four months, then I'd be back for emergency treatment. So I took a Pilates and I have to say, other than qualifying as a lawyer, it's the second thing that I've been most committed to in my life. Wow. So for the last seven or eight years, I have done it nearly every week, two or three times a week. Um, I did a class this morning online. So, and it's put, they've put me back together. I've got a great teacher who started to teach me and basically I've just put myself back together. So my neck doesn't hurt anymore. My back doesn't hurt so much. I wore five inch heels because I'm small and I want yes. to be tall. Yeah. So I ran around yeah. London. Oh God. I mean, I was like, you know, thought I was a supermodel in me big heels, but they were killing me. <laughs> so all of that, I was in, I was like, my Pilates teacher says to me when she met me seven years ago or something, she just cringed at the state of me she said you were so bad I thought thank god you didn't tell me but I've worked really hard at that so I do Pilates now it's a way of life for me and my pot I, I used to be like the woman in acorn antiques you know with the tray mm -hmm. kind of bent over and yeah. now I can I've got better posture um and I think it's that and I do a bit of walking I gave up running about three years ago because my knees were sore so I had to do that I didn't want to end up with knee replacement so I would say I should have done that years ago and I shouldn't have put myself through that and I should have, shouldn't have let myself get that bad. So, of course, I'm going to say to people out there, try to think about your well-being because, you know, it, it, it does, it, you can't keep doing it. And, you know, I got into my late 40s and was like, oh, my God, you know, my body was just f fighting back my mind, you know. So I, I wish I'd done it earlier, but, it, it, you know, that's what I, I would suggest to people you do it because it is very important and you will burn out and you will make yourself ill. Yeah. Because I think what I didn't realize was that stress makes you physically ill yes. and, and, as well as mentally. So my neck and my back problems were related to stress, not just my posture or my shoes or whatever. So I, I think I'm a reformed person. So, you know, I, I would say before, you know, I was terrible, but I'm, I can honestly say to you now, because I'm older, I'm, I'm a good girl now and I, and I do think about it. And I'm really interested when I listen to the podcast for you to hear what other people do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I try not to be as Bengali, you know, about it as well, because I'm sure, pe especially to younger people who haven't got as much time as I might have now. Yes. But because, you know, my boys are bigger. But, you know, it is really important. And I think we should we need to make time for it. Absolutely. Now, Donna, what about your, your mental health and your well-being that way? Because I know previously when you were on at our audience event, if you like, uh, webinar, we talked briefly about there being mental health with your mother um, when you were younger. Yeah. So um, I wondered if you can just share a bit about that and what you do for mindset, 
mental well-being, mental health, and whether you've imparted that onto your boys. I know they're at university now, but yeah. what do you do and how has that impacted on your life and, and professionally too? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, my mommy is suffers from mental, very serious mental health issues. She's in a nursing home, has been for a while. So I, I don't remember her not being mentally ill, to be honest. And I think definitely coming from um, with a, with someone in your family who suffers badly from mental health, one of my mum's biggest problems was anxiety and worry yes. about everything. Yes. So I definitely, definitely made a conscious decision very early on not to worry about things that I didn't have control over. You know, I mean, obviously we worry generally about things, but I, people who know me will say to you, I, it, it, you know, if something happens and I, I'm like this with my boys as well, if something happens and it's, you know, it seems like it's the end of the world because it does, doesn't it? When yeah. you're a certain age or, you know, but I just say nobody died. It's not the end of the world, you know, and, and I think you have to dust yourself down and move on. So I'm, I have this ability to look forward and not back you know, if I have made a mistake or I've messed up or I failed, I have to dust myself down and move on. So I, 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 I'm, I'm not bad at doing that. Yeah. And I do think that's probably down to that history in your family of yeah. seeing the, the devastation that it causes somebody, you know, to see the, what it, the devastation it caused my mom. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then the family as well, because you're all part of it. I really do make that conscious decision. And I think, I blame my my heritage and my and my DNA, but you know, uh, coming from Dublin, we we're not allowed to take life too seriously. Yeah. So I'm not serious all the time, and yeah. and and John has this this John has this thing he says to me, which sounds really derogatory and mean, but I think it's quite funny, and he doesn't mean it in a mean way. But you know, like on a Friday evening, uh, he sa he says you take your your drawer out of the office and put your brain in, close the drawer, and then you go off for the weekend. And I used to play with the boys, have a drink, have a bit of fun. But yeah. I needed that downtime. I didn't yes. want to be serious seven days a week. So yeah. that helps me as well. And even now, you know, I, I, people probably think I'm never serious. I am, obviously, or I wouldn't be working or doing what I'm doing. But yes. I'm not serious all the time. And I don't want to be. No, no. I'd be and worn I'm out. That would I'd be bored. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think that the mind functions better, doesn't it, when you've got a control, you know, whether you're recording a podcast, or you're writing books like I am or whatever. We do need that change of scenery, that change of behavior to recuperate. So I think that's um fantastic i'm gonna do that take my put my brain in the in the drawer at the weekend and then uh take yeah. it out on monday monday morning i love that i love that donna can i yeah. ask you for some more advice it's really quite tough for people to enter the law now um not just because of covid but prior to that there are n less training places young people come with debt uh people would like to enter the law but they, they don't know how to work it out whether through the apprentice router or otherwise so i wondered if you had Three tips for young people um, on really how to be more resilient and how to enter the law uh, and perhaps tips for women on how to remain in the law, because the two things are distinct and COVID has exacerbated that. And that's something that concerns me. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think um, one of the things I say, I would say in answer to both those questions, whether it's, um, uh, you know, a student or a young person or even or a woman, you know, be yourself is really important. And I touched on, didn't I, that I was frightened to be myself or I was, you know, I, I, I you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't sure if myself was good enough or I was, you know, I should be where I am. And I, so I, I, I tried to say to people when I meet them, you know, whether at work or, or students, be yourself, be proud of who you are, be proud of what you bring to the table, you know, this thing about being authentic, isn't it? And, and it takes courage to be yourself because, you know, and I don't mean be big headed or conceited, but, you know, be, you know, you, where everyone has something to offer and everyone has something special about them. So that's my first thing. The second thing I'd say to people, to students is, look, it's, it's hard work. I wouldn't ever lie to you and say, I mean, you know, over the nine years it took me to qualify as a solicitor, I was, you know, in the library when my friends were in the pub. I wasn't going to festivals because I couldn't have a hangover to study tomorrow. And, you know, so you have to give up stuff and you have to keep on plugging away and you will get rejections and you will get things wrong. So I keep saying hard work and and don't give up. And, and especially now because it's so hard, I think, you know, this year I've tried to do as much mentoring as I can. And I have come across some students who want to give up law or don't see a future and I'm saying to them, this is not a time to make a decision like that because it's not a normal time. 
you know, we're in an unprecedented pandemic. Exactly. So don't make that decision. Yeah, don't make that decision. And I hope I've deterred some of them over the, the last year or so. And also, if it doesn't work now, it will work. Keep on going. You know, when I didn't get accepted for the law degree, it didn't stop me becoming a lawyer. It just, I had to find another route. And I do say to them, do something else or put, do something that you can put on your CV, whether that's, you know, volunteering, whether that's, you know, mentoring yourself or doing something, but, you know, don't do nothing, do something and put it down and keep yourself busy. So that's my student thing. Um, I think in terms of women, um, always be yourself. Um, and I think particularly as a woman, because I think we have different uh, strengths um, and different things to bring to the table. So it's really important. You know, I think in terms of empathy and multitasking and all the men listening to this will all be going, oh yeah, of course, here we go. <laughs> but, you know, I agree, I think there, we are different and I think it's great and men and we work really well together. So that's great. Support other women. We have to support each other and that has got to continue. Um, and I say to women as well, as I say to students, don't give up. You know, again, if 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 you think it's too tough or you think you're not getting there. I mean, if you'd have said to me 25 years ago that I'd be sit, sitting where I am and that women would be sitting where they are. And I'm not saying they're where they should, they're where they, they need to be. But I'm saying the difference that I've seen in 25 years is brilliant. And I'm delighted. I mean, I've got um, a niece who's she, she just turned 20. She's probably looking at me now and thinking, oh, she's 21, I think. That's, a, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, she, the years are gone. I, know, and I don't I know, count COVID. I, I don't count COVID years. I'm not counting them. So she's probably still only about 12. <laughs> but, but I look at her and think, I don't want her to go through the stuff that I went yes, through. Quite. You know, I don't want her to have that, you know, being feeling irrelevant, um, harassment, you know, not being taken seriously, yes. being looked at. As a, diff, as a as a bit of a an object and not as a human being and not as a as a as somebody with intellect you know uh, that is not very pleasant and 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 you have to work 10 times harder to get where you sh- you want to be yeah. through all that rubbish i mean you know that's why i loved me too because it got rid of quite a lot of that stuff that you know some of us older women had to deal yeah. with and i and i don't want younger women to deal with that so i do think we have i'm delighted for them coming that some of the people like Lady Hale coming before us, the things they've done to change the the, the map and change the way things are is going to be brilliant for, for younger people. And I'm delighted about that. And I think, you know, what women keep it up. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But there is a, an awful long way to go. And there is still a lack of diversity in the Supreme Court if we just oh. start, if we just start there. But that's a whole other conversation, isn't it? That we are you're right, yeah. we are doing well. But when I look at my daughter, my third child, uh, you know, I'm kind of thinking, crikey, is she gonna have to work as hard as I have as a black woman? And you know, where yeah. are we? So you're right, things are changing, but there is still quite a way to go. So it, but it's great for us to see leaders like you talking about the subject so I, I found that all immensely helpful and support of the women which is a great 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 advice for all of us really as we're doing it what's next for donna scully i mean i could list off a whole load of things i'd like you to see law society presidency um <laughs> you know a book in there house of laws now you don't have to uh i know i've got big ambitions for you donna i mean i don't have any power i don't want people to think i've got some some power to make any of these things happen but uh i think role modeling is is, is uh important so i just wonder you know your boys are at uni um you know you're doing a lot more campaigning work uh and a lot of charity work uh, outside of carpenters and I just wonder what else is next for you have you got any plans yeah I'm laughing at (laughs) at some of your suggestions I mean people have suggested politics to me quite a lot obviously because I'm you know I love a soapbox and I'm I'm always giving out and and I have such strong opinions but it doesn't really attract me I have to say and I think it doesn't attract me because I'm not good at I'm not good at party line yeah and now I'm older and the only person I really have to answer to is John and he doesn't really curtail me that much. So I'm really lucky. So I have this freedom to speak and freedom to be myself at last. And I go, I don't want to be told the party line. So I'm not, I, it's not for me. So I'm, I, I, I mean, unless I change my mind, I, I, someone might probably show me this in a few years when, if I decide to do anything like that. But I don't feel that, f- feel that at the moment. But one of the things you do talk about, I mean, in terms of the industry, I still do my you know, industry stuff in terms of campaigning about around reforms that I think are good. I'm very 
strong on access to justice. Yeah. You know, I'm really worried about the state of access to justice at the moment and the erosion brick by brick of access to justice and especially for 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 no, for ordinary people um so i i'll continue you know on that fight i'll continue to try and you know persuade government to listen to us um and all that sort of stuff so i will continue that cuz that's very i'm very passionate about that yeah. but on the other side there is the charity stuff which i have been able to get involved in in the last few years in a much bigger way than before because i have more freedom and a bit more time and i'm absolutely loving it i mean i started doing some volunteering a few years ago and i was worried about doing it because i'm quite an emotional person so i thought oh my god i'd be crying all the time i'd be no use to anybody but i wasn't i i enjoyed it i think it was fun i i meeting people who are living in terrible circumstances really makes you very humble and i i couldn't believe how much i laughed how much i i obviously cried after i left them but in the when you're with them you're you're laughing so i think i want to continue my charity work i would love to have a foundation um and and to really kind of coordinate the bits i do ad hoc or whatever um i've been blown away in covid by the community spirit. I mean, I see it in Merseyside because I'm there, but I'm sure it's in lots of places around the country. But I think, you know, it's phenomenal when the need arises, how people who haven't even got much themselves get together to help people. So I'm really, I, I love sport. And I know I, I've seen your Twitter because I know you're <laughs> mad and, and you're looking for England to win on Sunday. Yes. So say no more. But but we, John and I do a lot of sponsorship around sport for inner city kids because I think it's a way of getting them away from trouble and giving them a chance at something else and learning leadership. So I think I'd like to do more of that. So yeah, I think for me now, I go, I've been so lucky. I'm lucky to be sitting here talking to you and I'd, I'd like to do with that. I'd like to continue that on and help try and help other people and try and make a difference and just do some good and just I think you know there's a lot of bad around at the moment isn't there in terms of hunger and homelessness and COVID and all sorts of things so you know if I can help there then that's that I, I really enjoy it I've met the most amazing people from other community charity groups and stuff and and I love it and it's and it's 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 just um just amazing to see what people do. So, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to be at. Now, if I change my mind, I'll let you know. Oh, well, <laughs> we've we heard it here first. Um, you know, the Donna Scully Foundation, or I don't know, the Carpenters Foundation. The Donna and John yeah, Foundation. Yeah, the Donna and John. <laughs> I like to put them in. <laughs> DJ, DJ Foundation. Yeah. Uh, or DNJ. Um, well, Donna Scully, it's been wonderful interviewing you here on Talking Law. It's been such a pleasure to hear your journey and your story in law. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you for having me. See you, Sally. A huge thank you to Donna Scully for talking law with me, Sally Penny, MBE. Don't forget my next book will be coming out, Talking Law and Skills. What skills will future lawyers need in the legal industry? with industry experts, from lawyers to leadership consultants. Thanks again to the Carpenters Group, one of the UK's leading personal injury practices, who also offer a wide range of services to their insurer and broker clients. More details on their website, carpentersgroup.co.uk. You can follow me on Twitter at SallyPenny1 or search for Sally Penny or Women in the Law UK on LinkedIn or Instagram. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks to our production team, Sam Walker and Michael Blaze at What Goes On Media. Bye for now. Hold up. 